So, hello everyone, my name is Steve. I am a uh, developer. <laughs> so, I'm going to talk to you about D3. This was a really, really, really cool chart, and for some reason my iframe isn't loading at the moment, and I'm going to blame the internet. If only I had an offline service workers. <laughs> Hot dog. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about D3. Um, I have written an entire charting library in D3 for my occupation, which is a business intelligence um, program. And uh, as you can see, one of D3's main cool things to do is transitions and animations uh, for various data. <laughs> uh, I didn't do that. Some other dude did that. The author of D3, as it were. Um, but the first thing I'd like to say about D3 is that it is not changing my slide. It is not a visualization library, which um, may come as a bit of a shock. Uh, it is great at doing visualizations, but it does not give you visualizations. Um, what does it do then? It gives you one-way data binding. Um, so, if you get a bunch of data from a server, uh, whether that's in an array or in a big JSON document, it provides a really, really good way of binding that to DOM elements in your, uh, in your page and managing the transitions uh, between the two. Um, so, as you saw in that previous one, uh, there was a bunch of uh, stock data coming in and it was able to display them in pie charts, donut charts, bars, lines, uh, areas. And it just, it was really, really simple to transition between all of them. Um, it also has lots of helpers for visualizations among it, um, especially in the SVG space. So um, you don't have to use SVG when you're using D3. Uh, you'd be crazy not to, but you don't have to. Um, but it also lets you generate scales for various different data um, sources. So whether it's date time, whether it's numerical data, um, logarithmic scales or linear scales or whatever, um, categorical data. Uh, it really just provides you the ability to create scales and transition between all of them. Um, and then very, very powerful tweening and interpolation to, like I said before, move from one data point to another. Um, so just so I have an idea, who here has worked with D3 before? About half and, uh, yeah, I'll look. <laughs> um, so you guys can probably just tweet or something while I go through the basics, um, just to get the rest up to speed. Um, but the basis of D working with D3 is working with these selection objects. So you'll see here I've got a function that takes in a container element, and I go d3.select, um, which will, it's kind of like jQuery select, it can take in an element or a selector, and then you go dot select all div.person. So that'll look for all the divs on the page uh, under this element, that has a class of dot person. So at the moment, there's absolutely no data binding going on there. It's just saying, here's all um, the div dot persons, um, which will generally, the first time you call it, be an empty array. Um, the first thing you need to do then is bind some data to it. Uh, so I've written a little function here to generate a bunch of sample people. Um, and so I go dot data generate sample, and then this second function here uh, returns the unique identifier for that person. Um, it's actually really, really important to have that unique identifier. If you don't have it there, it'll just order it by what order your array is in. And so often you'll get really, really weird animations if you forget that for a tip. Um, another thing to note is that a lot of these functions in D3, um, they'll modify the, the state of the selection and then they'll just return the selection again. So you can continue to chain, chain them together. Um, so when it comes to dealing with some of the transition, uh, some of the, when data comes in and data comes out, uh, that's done through this enter and exit methods on the selection. And so you can see here, when a new person comes in to my selection, I want to add a div for it, I want to give it a class of person, and then I want to set the text to who has and commits. And then on the case where they exit, um, I just want to remove them. So in this case, I've got absolutely no data binding at all, but you can see with this sample data that is small, but you'll have to deal with it because it will ruin my slide layout if I make it bigger. Um, 
that there's the commit showing up there. And if I continue to run it through with different sample data, they come and go as they please. Um, oh, that's one thing I should have mentioned with this one. So you notice with this one though, that even though I continue to hit run, the number of commits for those people aren't actually changing, even though the randomized data that I'm throwing at it is cha changing. That's because I've only got enter and exit um, functions to find. I don't actually have any updates. Um, but thankfully, they're easy. I just moved the setting the text from the enter onto the selection itself. And that has the effect of updating the text as we go. So we can see here that all of them now change. And it's brilliant. Uh, next is transitions. So it's kind of boring when they just show and hide and scrap. Um, you can do that in anything. Uh, and, uh, what's called D3? That's what it's called. Uh, it lets you specify transitions. So what I do here, when they enter, I initially set their opacity to zero. Uh, but when they exit, I say transition for a duration of DT, uh, which is some other function. Um, that returns an int in milliseconds. And then I set the opacity to zero there and remove it. So what this transition does, it doesn't return a selection, it returns what's called a transition, which rather than just setting opacity straight away, it'll tween the, current, the opacity from the current value to the value that you're specifying here. Um, and you can see on update, I do the same thing. I transition and then I set the opacity to one. So what, what that'll do, something will enter, the opacity will get set to zero, it'll go into this update function, which happens for all the elements, and it'll um, tween the opacity to one. If then you get more data from the server, and it starts to exit, so actually you get less data from the server, you could say, um, it'll go into here, um, and then it'll fade out to zero. And so let's see that with my sample codes here. So we started off with five, we'll hit run, it's still five. There's one that's just faded in, yeah, the other one will actually disappear, and that's them fading out and fading in. And with that knowledge, you can make all the shiny visualizations you want in the world. It's really just a matter of deciding what styles you want to set, what attributes on the DOM you want to set, and um, how, how to fade them in and out. And you can interpolate your heights, your widths, your colors, anything that you want. Any questions? That's no it is. Um, the next thing that D3 is pretty powerful at is generating scales. What is a scale? A scale is a transform plus a bunch of other stuff. Um, so what a transform does is it allows you to map an input, so called domain, to an output known as the range. Um, the domain and range are maths terms, um, but they're quite suitable here. Um, the important thing to know about transform transforms is that they are completely stateless themselves and um, that means that they're completely predictable. So if you give it the same data, it will return you the same value, no matter how many times you call it. It's pretty important to not set state on your transforms. Um, there's a few different types. Uh, so you've got numerical and categorical. Categorical. So numerically, things like your commit count, your age, your height, and your categorical as your month and your occupation. Um, and in that, there's also continuous and discrete. Um, it's important to Think about the data that you have and what kind of scale is suitable for it. Um, one of the tricky ones is something like time. Uh, is time continuous? Is it discrete? Depends on whether you talk to a quantum physicist or not. And um, so often if you're working with dates, you've really got a discrete data set, not a continuous data set, because each day is an individual day. Um, that's still up for debate though. You still might want a line chart for that. Um, oh, the other thing is with dates, you're often missing dates. So if you've got commit count per developer at your workplace on a chart, you probably don't want to show the weekend, in which case you don't have continuous data, you've got um, yeah, discrete data. Um, so D3 provides a bunch of uh, scales out of the box for this. Uh, so you've got linear scales, so if you've got a domain from 5 to 20, you can map from 50 to 200 and it'll just multiply each one by 10. And you've got an identity one which just returns the same values. You've got a power, so if you've got a, a domain of one to 10 and an output of one to 100, um, it'll do it by uh, squaring each value. 
and logarithmic the same but backwards. Um, so that's the basic theory, and here's some examples of how you set them up. So a linear one, I tell what the domain is, 50 to 200. I tell what the range is, 500 to 200. And calling it straight like that will just give me the results. Um, there's some categorical scales. Uh, they're the examples, but I'll just jump to code. So an ordinal scale is what they call their categorical ones. And by calling the domain of foo, bar, basm, quarks, you get 0 to 200, and essentially it'll just put it at the midpoint between each of those. Um, so it's divided the range into blocks of 500 and chosen the midpoint, and it's that simple. Um, that one specifies the padding from the edge, so I wanted the gap of... Uh, is there a whiteboard? There's no whiteboard. Oh no, it's going to be terrible. Yeah, the one's the padding between the points um, at the edges of the chart. Um, Um, and range band, so the points are very good if you've got a scatter style chart. So if you want to put a dot for foo and a dot for bar and a dot for bas and a dot for quarks, it works really well because it, it'll give you the midpoint of each of the, um, the sections for the categories. Um, but if you want something like a bar chart where you also want the width of the bar to be important and for there to be a bit of a gap between them, you use range band. Um, and so the domain's identical and the range bands, in this case, I use numbers that just sort of gave me nice numbers for the output. Um, so the range goes from 0 to 2100 with a padding of 0.2 of the bar width. So in this case, um, the bar width is 500. And so the first one will go from, and it's 400. Sorry, it's 400. I said, wow, well, what's the number? It's not good. So the range band there it tells you the, the width that the bars will be from 400. And so foo will go from 100 to 100 plus 400, which is 500. The uh, bar will go from 600 to 1,000, and bars will go from 1,100 to 1,500. And so you can see it's got a gap of 100 in the middle, and yeah, 100 between each one. Does that make sense? You all good? Um, yeah, they don't have demo code. Um, and on date time, I'm just going to say that they're never simple. The date time works very similar to the linear um, range in that if you use something like this here. Instead of going d3.scale, you go d3.time.scale. You give it a domain of a start date and an end date and an output range, then calling with any date in here will give you the appropriate output. So as far as d3 is concerned, it's very similar to a linear scale. But as I said before, you need to really think about your own domain. If you've just got dates, you probably want to use categorical and just put dates in as strings in your domain. Um, you probably save yourself a fair bit of pain that way. Um, so if we put all that together, I'll show you an example of a bar chart. So this is a fair bit of code to produce this. <coughs> you can see how they run it. It transitions between them each time with new data. Um, and this also shows the importance of uh, sorting your data properly when you get it in as well. Because see how the names are jumping around a fair bit and it's kind of bit difficult to follow what's happening. If I just turn shuffle off there, um, then once they get into their proper order, it's a lot easier to show which ones have come in and which ones have exited. So in this case, let's find one with three colors. Um, in this case, the blue represents Windows developers, the orange is Linux developers, and the green are Macintosh developers. Apple, A, OS X, whatever you want to call them. So, um, I grab my sample data. Um, in practice, you'll call a function like this every time new data comes in from the server, rather than generating sample data. Um, so the first thing I do is I go through the data and I s grab all the people's names and I put that into an array. I grab all the people's operating systems and I put that into an array. And then they commit counts as well. Um, I create a scale for the x-axis, which goes from zero to the maximum of all the commit counts. Um, those of you who have used uh, math to get the max of an array of numbers will see that D3 has made that a lot better for us by just letting us pass an array to it rather than a comp-separated list of numbers or math.max.apply. Um, and in this case, I'm setting the range to 0 to 450 because um, I want 
the biggest bar to be 450 long. Um, if you have a look at the, the bar chart though, um, this isn't zero, this is zero on my SVG, um, but that's 450 long. That'll be important to know soon. Um, the next thing is I set up a Y scale, um, which is where all my categories go for my people. And so I set the domain to each of the people's names, and I give it some range bands that sort of gave me a nice looking chart. I've got 350 pixels high, and I've got a gap of 0 0.2. 0 0.2 nearly always works out fantastically for charts, I find. And then I've also generated this color scale, which I didn't go through before. Um, so I've just said category 10, that'll uh, produce me 10 colors, and um, I just give it the domain of the categories for those colors, um, which in this case is just Windows, Linux, and Mac. Um, okay, so my container element here was a div, uh, so I want to put an SVG in there to render into. Um, I haven't actually found a better way to do this than this, and I'm not really pleased with it, but what I do is I collect all the SVGs, I just assign it a single string data, and then I say when it enters, append an SVG, and because I didn't want to deal with CSS, <laughs> um, I just gave it a week and a half directly. Um, then with that SVG, uh, I select all of the rectangles with the person class, and I bind it to my people. Um, and then for the ones that are entering, I add a rectangle, apply a class of person, set its X to 100, which if you're paying attention, you'll know what that's for. Um, I set the Y value to be what the Y scale returns there. So in this case, the Y value will be the bottom of the bar because it's SVG and that measures from the bottom. And the height I set to be the range band of the Y scale, so that'll be the width of the bar. I initially want the width to be zero and the opacity to be zero. Um, that way I get a nice slide in from the side effect and it'll fade in. Um, when they exit, I want to slide them back to zero and I want them to fade out, so I just set the style and, uh, and the width back to zero. Yeah, the opacity and the width back to zero and uh, call dot remove. And then for the updates, um, I, I transition for the same duration and I set the Y scale. The reason I do this in the update phase rather than the enter phase is because new data points may come in and, come and go, and so the position along the y-axis will change, and the width of the bars will change as data comes in and out. So it's important that you do that sort of thing in your update, not your enter, because um, it will be different. Um, and then I also apply the width. You see me setting the fill here to the color scale based on the operating system, and I save it in as well. Um, for the labels on the left, I do what's Pretty similar to the bars. Um, I get all the text, I set the X to the Y's to the Y scales, plus the range band, it's that divided by two here, that's off screen, um, just so it's in the center of the bar. I set the opacity to zero, fade them in as they come in, and then on update, I set their Y position as well so that they move around as the data comes in and out. Um, so that's the manual way of doing axes. There's also an automatic way of doing axes that comes with D3, um, which is in this d3.svg.axis. So you just give it the scale that you want to use, whether you want it top, bottom, left or right. You then create a G element for the axis, which is the same enter and append stuff that we've had before. Um, you translate the group to the correct position. In this case, that's going to be down the bottom. And then you... Um, on a transition, you just dot .call axis. Um, what call will do is it will invoke that function for every element in the selection, and this um, d3.svg.axis returns a function that essentially draws your whole axis for you. So if we go back to the demo here, you'll see all this stuff down here uh, was generated by that axis function, which is kind of handy. It doesn't give you that much control, though. Like if I wanted to put a little tick on each of these, I couldn't do that with the access function. So if you're happy with the defaults, it works pretty well. Um, I've tended to steer clear of it because uh, it wasn't customizable enough for me. Uh, so yeah, there it is running through between, between each bit. Um, any questions on that so far?
Ooh. Okay, so um, when you're dealing with real-time updates of a time axis, it gets pretty complicated. Um, so here's the example that I have. Um, this is just me putting in random data. Um, that it just twiddles by up to 10 pixels each step. And I've got the number of seconds appearing in this thing along the top. I accidentally called it bottom oriented, not top oriented, which is why the numbers are on the wrong side of the axis. Um, so it'll be red if it's increased, and oh, sorry, red if it's decreased, and green if it's increased. That's what the colors are. So I'll show you how I went through that. Um, I've got a function here to just generate another data point, and then I've got an array. I've got a mouse and it makes it difficult to scroll without a mouse. <laughs> um, I've got an array here which is holding the collected data, uh, which contains the time of the, the data point, the status of the data point, and a value for the, for the data point. Uh, this is creating an X scale, and you see I haven't actually set the domain on this X scale yet. That's because the domain keeps changing and I have to update the domain whenever any new data point comes in. Um, so I don't set the domain yet. But I do set the range because I know exactly how much room on my chart I've got. Um, the Y scale is pretty much identical uh, to the previous one, and the color scale is pretty sure it's got good and bad, green and red. Um, I do the same SVG trickery as before. I generate an axis. Um, here's another neat little thing, is that D3 comes with a fair bit of string and date formatting stuff. Um, so I want to say for each tick, I want to show the hour, minute, and second, and it just works. Um, I want to say here that I want a tick to appear every one second, um, which is pretty cool. So then I've just got a dodgy set interval here, um, because I don't have a live server to give me data. I grab the next data point, I put it onto the data, and then I um, get the max of all the times in that data to get the maximum. And then I say the minimum time is going to be five seconds before the minimum. Um, and then I look through the data and just keep shifting off the array while um, the times are lower than the minimum time. Uh, that makes sure that I don't have any data points at all that are more than five seconds old. Um, and this is the point where I now set the domain. I know the minimum time, I know the maximum time, and I can say, hey chart, that's the, that's the data points that you'll be showing between this domain. Um, I then grab all the circles, map the data to it. Um, though I think it now occurs to me that I didn't need to do this in here because I'm using the same instance as the array. That doesn't matter. Um, so when they enter, I add a circle, I set the radius to three. When they exit, I remove, so I couldn't be bothered transitioning the entries and exits. Um, I've added an easing function to the transitions of the updates here to be linear. If I made then the default, which is ease in, ease out, the point is sort of a warp, 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 which is kind of lame. Um, so much better to just use a linear easing function there, and it just appears to be a nice, solid, smooth um, animation. Um, I set the X and Y to the X and Y scale, and the fill to the color scale. Um, again, for this one, I probably could have used the enter instead, because it doesn't actually change every data point, or every um, between each tick. And then um, I did the same sort of access stuff here. And there's our result. So I'll just show you that again. Speed it up, put more points in. Okay, that is more buggy than I expected. <laughs> Close than that. <laughs> okay, so that's it using circles at each data point. And I'll show you the same example, but using uh, an SVG path so that I get a line instead of um, set of points. And all this is the same except for here, where instead of uh, setting up circles, I create a path, I bind it to the collected data, I add it in, and then this is a helper in D3 to create uh, lines basically out of the SVG path element. And you just tell it what function to use for the X and what function to use for the Y. And oftentimes that's trivial, you just delegate to a scale and it'll do it for you. Um, so, 
when it comes down to doing the transition, just here, um, all I need to do is set the D attribute of the path to the path transform, and it'll do it for me. So there's our results, and it all looks good until the line reaches the end, and then it just starts doing this weird wiggle thing. Um, <laughs> so the reason for that is because the interpolation for strings in D3 just sort of looks for numbers and then interpolates the numbers. It'll look for a number and interpolate the numbers. And those of you familiar with SPG, it's basically M, then a position, L, and then a position, L, and then a position. So each of those positions are just being transformed um, individually. And of course, in the, in the string representing this, this one just interpolates up and down, this one just interpolates up and down. It's quite crap as far as um, cool transition goes. <laughs> um, so I was going to go into why and how to fix that, um, but I'm running long time. And Instead, I'll point you to this page here, which tells you the solution, which gets you a nice thing like that. Or, like this, which tells me my scroll position on the page as time goes on. It's kind of funny. Um, yeah, so it's not a simple problem to fix, but there are solutions for that, and um, this is the author of D3 that's given this one, so he's pretty clever. Um, so finally, uh, an example of using maps uh, with D3. Um, so I went and got a bunch of cyclone data from the Bureau of Meteorology, and I thought, I'm going to put them on a map, and have a look how we're going. And so there's my map, and there's my paths for all of the cyclones. Um, so this is 50 cyclones um, from the past 40 years, uh, and the positions that they take. And as you can see, it zooms nicely get good positions, and if I jump up to show the last 500 instead, and just clear and run it because I'm an awesome programmer, you can see how quick that was. That's me showing 500 paths of cyclones, and it just showed up, and this is a terrible laptop. Um, so, uh, has anyone here worked with Leaflet? A couple? Leaflet is basically your go-to if you want to do custom mapping. Um, it's fantastic. Um, so in this case, I create a leaflet map on the container element and tell it where I want it in terms of longitude and latitude. And then I say, here's where to get your tiles from. In this case, it's OpenStreetMap because it's free. Um, and then I create an SVG element onto the overlay pane of the map, um, which is a pane of the map that scrolls as you scroll um, using CSS transform, so it's really, really fast. I then use D3 CSV function, which goes and fetches a CSV from the server and gives me the data. Um, because Bureau of Meteorology are awesome and don't know about JSON. Um, so then I look through and put it into a nice easy to use object instead of their CSV stuff. Um, so essentially I pull out an array that has uh, the cyclone name, uh, sorry, the cyclone ID, the cyclone name, and then an array of longitude and latitudes and a severity at each longitude and latitude. I didn't actually have time to use the severity. I was going to color the lines by severity, but that gets into SVG gradient levels and no time. Um, so as before, I create a SVG line. I set the tension to zero, so I get the nice spline style behavior. And then I set the X and Y to this um, project point function for the longitude and the latitude for the X and Y. It's a little inefficient in that it's going to be calling project point twice um, for each data point, but I didn't care about that too much. Um, and that just delegates to leaflet and say, what's your position on the layer for that longitude and latitude? So you can see the um, interaction with leaflet is actually quite simple. Um, I then grab all the cyclone paths, um, and then I bind it to, ah, uh, okay. This is me overloading that duration text box just so I could show you the change in different number of cyclones. Um, if I'm just basically binding it to cyclones. I create a path for each one, I set it to red with a strength width of two. And every time the 
uh, view reset is when I draw. Because in Leaflet, when you zoom in and out, it renders the view reset event. Uh, okay. So in the view reset is where I essentially set the um, the D attribute of my paths, um, which just calls that transform method, which I believe was my line. Yeah, which is my SVG line here. Um, and that's all you need to show the points, uh, to, to render the lines, and that's all really, really good. Um, but because Leaflet supports panning and things like that, uh, you don't really know what size of SVG you need, because if you've got an SVG that takes up this much space, and the user goes, oh, I'm going to switch fling it this way, then the SVG will just go over here, and you might be able to see any of your stuff. So you need to reposition... Uh, yeah, sorry, you need to me... Let me restart that, that's right. If you've got your... Path, your, your map view box is say this, and your paths <coughs> fly off the screen here because your cyclones go off the edge of the, um, the div for your leaflet maps. Um, you need to make sure that you set the SVG size to the extents of all those paths because it won't do that automatically for you. And that's all this is doing. Um, so I get the node from that group element um, that we put all the paths in, and I call get B box, which will just get the browser to tell me what the extents of that box were. And then I set the SVG size to be identical to that box, and it's all simple. Um, I also translate it to the right position because, uh, yeah, it's like these bounds X and Y have to be relative to the um, containing element. In any case, um, that's your end result from that. So you can see that when, when I'm just doing this, there's no D3 code happening whatsoever. Um, that's just the... I uh, transform a leaflet doing its job, but when I zoom in, each time those things disappear and reappear, it's gone through that view reset event where it's recalculated all of the um, longitudes and latitudes. So you can do some pretty tricky optimizations here, like if I'm zoomed out this far, uh, I probably don't need to render every single data point along the path because there's too many data points along the path and there's not that many pixels on the screen. Um, and so you can do lots of fancy things like reducing the quality of the path of the, of the data points that you have depending on your zoom level and things like that. And that's how she is done. Any questions for that rush talk?